with the issue itself. Well, just for people are using it to pry. I think in I one think the reputation the of steroids has damaged some sense of the integrity of the game and. The commissioner Bud Selig is aware of this, and if it was up to him, just like if it was up to almost you know any employer left to their own devices, why not have the maximum amount of drug testing? You know, mm -hmm. why not have more control over your employees, especially if you're like baseball and they can't really go elsewhere. You know, they can contractually go to a different team, but if there is some agreement that Major League Baseball comes up with mandates or, com or comes to an agreement with the players' union, you have to abide by that, and there are no other leagues if you want to play competitive baseball. Mm -hmm. So uh, what C League wants to do is to have the players accept testing that they so far have refused to accept. I mean, they already do accept testing, but he wants the punishments to be stronger, the testing to be more regular, etc. And uh, he's unsatisfied with the process of the normal collective bargaining, which is done under normal federal law. So he's bringing in the politicians to come and apply public pressure. What, what I understand is that the, a lot of these drugs, they're simply masking agents that you can take that shield people from being able to detect them in your bloodstream. I guess that's why they have random testing so that people do not know in time to either stop taking the, the drug before they're tested or actually use what's called a masking agent. I understand that you can mask them with other, with other chemicals. But also, you know, you're talking about there's just one league. I know in bodybuilding, people actually got interested in how far the human body can go without steroids because most or all bodybuilders that you see like the Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia are using steroids and other things as well and there, so there's other leagues in bodybuilding that have formed where you have the non-steroid bodybuilders and you have the uh, steroid bodybuilders or the drug, they don't talk about it openly but so we have two different leagues and the people that want to go and see the one can go and see the one. In fact, they even will have contests at the same place where you have the natural bodybuilders, then they have the other bodybuilders. So the people will they'll draw a crowd, uh, as big a crowd as they can for both events. So and I think that maybe makes that will happen in baseball. Who knows? We'll have the steroid bodybuilding <laughs> steroid leagues and the non-steroid leagues. I, I would like to see that, but all I know is I is as long as George Bush is going to be talking about this in his State of the Union address, which he did oh. in 2004. Wow. Right? You know, talk about your 16 words. He went on for an entire paragraph about steroids and baseball and sending the right message to the children and all this kind of stuff. Um, as long as he's going to be talking about this and Senator McCain is going to be introducing legislation, as long as this is even entertained, I will say this. If you're going to do this, then the first people who get tested are the president and the members <laughs> of this. I'm not kidding. Uh -huh. I mean, what is more important to the national security of the nation? What is more in the public interest sure. that Rafael Palmero is or is not on steroids or that maybe John McCain's flying out of his head on coke? <laughs> I would like to know this. And I think I have more of a right to know about John McCain's drug use than I do about Certainly. Rafael Palmero's. And this is uh, heady stuff for John McCain to, to threaten with baseball. I'm going to regulate baseball. You know, this is a, a power trip, I think. John McCain, who's a very interesting character, I've recently read uh, several books about him. Um, he has again and again across various uh, angles, uh, whether it's campaign finance reform or whether it's trying to regulate the way that Hollywood markets itself. Mm -hmm. um, he believes that the proper role of government is to apply uh, strong pressure, threats of legislation on business to help clean up their acts. Uh, and part of that also, st strangely enough, because of his military background, um, his ultimate goal is not necessarily good governance. Although I think, he, of course, he wants good governance, his own idea of but it. But he has a different idea he than has a, different a lot idea. of other people do, and certainly that we do. But his stated goal is to restore the people's trust in government. And think about that for a second. He says it over and over and over again in his most recent biography, the, the follow-up to the faith of uh, our fathers. Um, he says that as a, a military man, as of, uh, you know, from multi-generational Navy family that he's from, that's his higher calling is to restore um, Americans' faith in wow. government. Before we move on, another odd thing about him was he actually uh, saw a new sport happening, which was kind of like boxing and wrestling combined with martial arts martial artist fighting, and he went and uh, eliminated that for a while nationwide. He just saw this sport that he didn't like. He said, this is barbaric. And he went state to state and pushed legislation in each state 
until he got this sport off of pay-per-view. Now it's come back, and but it's just an odd control freak thing to do. I didn't know that. That's very interesting. And it's a maybe, maybe, maybe you should write about that. In the uh, that would be, may be interesting. But anyway, I think another thing that you write written about for Reason Magazine has been government secrecy. That's right. So what? Why? Why is the government keeping secrets from us? Because the people who are running the government, uh, specifically uh, George Bush, but especially Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, have a 30-year track record, very clear, very strong, to try to repeal what they see as the excesses of the post-Watergate reform era. Mm -hmm. Because it is their belief, and I think it's a sincerely held belief, that the only way for America to win the war on terror or to... Uh, exercise its power in the way that it needs to to protect the American people is if it has wide latitude to maybe break a few eggs in order to make that perfect omelet and also to work with secrecy in order mm -hmm. to do that. Um, it is their belief that things like Abu Ghraib, the tragedy of Abu Ghraib, is as much having to do with the revelation of it than it is the actual fact of it, which I think is borne out again and again in the way that the definitions of what is permissible in terms of uh, prisoner interrogation mm -hmm. have been made more elastic by, uh, by Alberto Gonzalez and other people in the administration. They clearly have expanded what they think that they can do, but they've seen it, and there's been more than two dozen reports internally done by the Pentagon and uh, by the various like subcontracting agents that they work with talking about America's uh, uh, sort of bad reputation in the world, how to deal with its public image. Again and again and again, they go back to Abu Ghraib as um, this is something that we need to prevent. And it's not because of what happened, but it's because of its effect on global public opinion. Secrecy was lost. Yes. Their secret, they weren't able to hush it up. It's right. something that they wanted. It was top secret, classified operation that they wanted to keep. It's very Under interesting. Wraps. It's very interesting that I mean, some of the aspects of Abu Ghraib and other uh, prisoner abuse things did come out. And it did come out in in uh, documents that were made public, even if quietly, by the Pentagon, Defense Department, and so on. Um, but that was all the written word. Mm -hmm. The images is what, and, and it was on the record for right. three or four months. It's the images that really catalyzed public opinion, and that is precisely what the administration has been fighting tooth and nail to suppress ever since. And There's those snuck out. How did those get out? How did those get out? They got out originally through uh, the Washington Post got a hold of one batch. There's been two batches uh, uh, that have gone public and that's it. The Lindy England, you know, thumbs up mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. And I believe the Washington Post got the first batch and the second batch was through Newsweek. But since then, if you recall about eight or ten months ago, everything that the government had was actually viewed by, if I'm not mistaken, all members of the House and Senate who wanted to see them. And they came out just shaken and horrified, saying, you know, when this is ever made public, uh, there's just going to be hell to pay. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Those images have never been made public. Oh. There's been a series of lawsuits by... To try to get them. To try to get them by the ACLU, by the Federation of American Soci uh, Scientists, and by several other... Uh, uh, government sunshine type of uh, mm -hmm. organizations. And the ACLU has dislodged literally more than 2,000 reports, um, very graphic and horrible in detail, having to do with prisoner abuse in Guantanamo Bay, in uh, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, of course in Iraq, but they've never released a single image. And right now there is a, uh, a suit and a case right in front of a judge in New York a judge that's very unsympathetic to the administration's uh, arguments. The administration is basically arguing, and it's ridiculous on its face, that they don't want to release the images, unlike the written word, because that would violate the privacy of the prisoners. Ah. Uh, which, of course, is alleviated like this by putting the little sort of porno black strip right. over their eyes, which the judge pointed out. So right now, uh, we could be seeing the next release of those images but the uh, government is taking the final step of saying, well, the president has the prerogative just to say you can't see this. And unfortunately, there is some uh, uh, Supreme Court history on their side. You know, there's a classic case that, and whose name I forget, but it came uh, post-war, 1948 or so, um, where it was a woman who was trying to get information about her father's plane crash. Her dad worked some kind of defense department. Right. 